A text for this morning is the uh, two lessons read from you from uh, John, especially this one from 1 John 4. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Ah, well, yes, the preacher's conundrum. How do you deal with it when you're supposed to preach on love your neighbor and your Indiana Hoosiers just beat the Missouri Tigers? How do you, what do you do with that? Do you, you know, do you rub it in a little bit? Do you just let it go? Do you look the other way? Well, I've decided to just let it go. I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm just going to love you as I would love myself. That's probably what I would want if it was the other way around, that you would be kind and gracious. So we will get right into the text this morning about loving your neighbors. The past few weeks we've been talking about this concept of love because it is central to uh, who we are at Messiah, who we are as God's peoples, at, people as followers of Christ. That's kind of uh, the bullseye, really, to love God and love your neighbor. At least that's the way Jesus seems to feel about it. When asked what was the most important thing, that's what he said. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. He makes it quite simple, actually. He makes it very simple, and that love of God and neighbor is right in the middle of it. It's the bullseye. It is the the center, the essence, really, of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And we talked the last two weeks about how God fosters and grows and deepens that love that we have for him, how that happens Uh, profoundly here in worship as God's people gather together. That's where he feeds and nurtures that love as we gather around his word. And also in our daily lives of worshiping him, our daily personal devotional lives of spending time alone with Jesus every day in his word and in prayer, interacting with him as we walk through this life. And today we consider the third part of that, that those who love Jesus who realize what they have done for him, who follow him, who walk with him, who live in him, that the the most natural way to express that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we'll kind of uh, dig into that thought process a little bit today. You heard it, dear friends, since God has loved us, so we also ought to love one another. If you boil it down to it, that really is the focus of what life is about. It's about relationships. Relationships. Being in right relationship with God and being in right relationship with your neighbor. If you ever find yourself in this world uh, lost, disoriented, confused, uh, struggling to, to make sense of, of where you are and what you should be doing and maybe why things aren't fitting together the way they seem they should be in this life, that's the easiest place to go. Right back to the heart of what Jesus tells us it means to be a Christian. To grow deeper in relationship, in love with Jesus Christ. And to love one another. If your eyes are fixed on that, it doesn't mean that that we'll ever master it, that we'll ever be perfect at it. We all have our struggles. We all have our challenges. Life can get very complicated as we wrestle with sin and the temptations and all the voices that speak to us in this life. And we'll always be wrestling with that. But as long as our eyes are fixed on those, on Jesus Christ and loving him more and loving our neighbor as long as we're, we're focused and looking at those and living those, we'll be in step with him. Life will make sense. There will be purpose. This, you don't want to miss this one. You don't want to miss the concepts behind this. That life is about loving Jesus first. And when that happens, the expression of it is to love others. That's how life 
works. There are so many places that we could go today in the Scriptures to uh, dig into this, of, of how, how and why this works, loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, today I chose uh, John, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, uh, a lesson from his gospel because he speaks so much about love and his first letter to the church, that letter that talks so much about the importance of of love. You heard very strong, clear words this morning. Um, it makes a lot of sense that John would talk so much about that because that was his personal experience. His story is the story of a man whose life, whose heart, whose mind was completely transformed when he experienced the love of Jesus Christ. You maybe know a little bit about John because he's kind of an important character in the Gospels. He's not just one of the twelve. He was also in the inner circle, the, the three disciples that were closest to Jesus. John, his brother James, the sons of Zebedee they're called, and Peter. Those were the three that Jesus took with him up on the Mount of Transfiguration that uh, he revealed his glory to. Those were the three that he often took aside and, and taught them even more things than the other that were kind of the leaders of the disciples. And John, it, it seems from the gospel that John may have had the closest relationship with Jesus of all. It's kind of an interesting story, though, as it unfolds. It wasn't always that way for John when he was initially called by Jesus. Jesus had a nickname that he gave to John and his brother James. He called them the Sons of Thunder, which was really not a flattering nickname. The Sons of Thunder. Uh, it came about, I, I think it was probably one of those nicknames that uh, Jesus and maybe the disciples used kind of to, that was kind of fun and kind of funny, but yet at the same time kind of had a point that maybe got their attention a little bit. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus and the disciples were going somewhere to the villages in Samaria on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified, and he would go into the villages and preach and teach and then move on. And one of those villages in particular in Samaria said, no thanks, Jesus, um, we don't really want or need you here. Well, Jesus just turned and went to the next, started to go to the next village, but not James and John. They were very frustrated by that. They were angered by it, and so they ran to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, would you like us to call down fire from heaven and destroy this village? Well, thanks for the help, John, but I've got things under control myself. Uh, just let that sink in for a moment of just kind of how much they... John was not quite getting it. It hadn't quite connected yet to what, who Jesus was, what he had really come for, the extent of his love for all people. And just imagine what Jesus' reaction must have been with that. Oh, John, John, John. First of all, I, I don't need your help calling down fire from heaven. Second of all, don't think so highly of yourself. And third of all, I didn't come into this world to destroy people. I came into this world to save them. When Jesus turned and left that village, he wasn't filled with anger and hatred toward them. He was heartbroken. He pitied them. He was filled with sadness and compassion for them. They were so close to the kingdom of God. The Son of God was at their doorstep and they didn't see it. I suppose it was very similar to when he wept over Jerusalem. His heart's desire was that they would know the love that God had for them. He didn't desire to destroy them. He had a desire to redeem them. So Jesus called them the sons of thunder. John must have been just a little, a little quick-tempered, a little too adversarial, a little too 
uh, you know, confrontational. He had something to learn about the love of Jesus Christ, his love for people. Well, John continued to follow him, and he, he did have that one other struggle too, maybe you remember. Kind of had the wrong idea about power and authority. James and John, at the urging of their mother, went to Jesus and said, hey Jesus, when you, you know, when eventually get to heaven and you're seated at, on your throne, could one of us sit on your right hand and the other on your left hand? That would be so cool. And Jesus said, John, yeah, you, you really still don't quite get it. That's, that's not why I have come. It's, it's not about power and authority and ruling and reigning over people. It's about coming to redeem the people I love. You know, I, it doesn't tell us in the Gospels exactly how it happened or when it happened but at some point, John began to see things differently. He walked with his Savior day after day, watching him, listening to him, taking his words and his actions to heart, and eventually his eyes and his mind and his heart began to see why Jesus had really come at some point in the gospel, John gets a new nickname. We, we don't know if Jesus gave it to him or if somehow he, he gave it to himself, but eventually he started identifying himself in his gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, talk about a different identity. At some point, that's how he wanted to be identified. That's what he wanted to be known with. 100%, my identity is this. I am a child of God who is loved by Jesus. And that's all you need to know. Changed everything. Do you see how that worked? He walked with Jesus. He spent time with him every day. He listened to his word. He talked with Jesus. And it changed him. It changed what he saw and what he thought and what he felt and how he lived. It changed his life when he came to realize that Jesus had come into this world to save sinners like John, that he was going to go to the cross and lay down his life to atone for his sins, to make him right with God. And his conclusion, you heard this morning. You heard. In that lesson, these, these words that he recorded in 1 John, this is love, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's how it works. This is the true, divine, godly kind of love Then he knows that when it is shown to our neighbors, begins to change people's lives. And so John wrote extensively in his letters about this love of God so people would know, so they would know when they saw it what true divine love from God in Jesus Christ was. See, because that was the other thing about John that's important to know is that when he began his apostolic ministry, those first 30 years or so, when the New Testament church was beginning, people were teaching all kinds of false things about Jesus and about the gospel. They were taking all kinds of man-made, man-thought-up ideas about what love was and what life was about, and they would kind of blend those things together with Jesus. And sometimes they sounded kind of good, but they weren't quite right. And so John sets out to set the record straight so that you would know what true divine love is, what it really means to love your neighbor as God loves you. And he gave people a little test. 
He said, here's your test. Here's these three things that anybody who talks to you about what true love really is, this is how you screen it. This is how you know if it really knows what they're talking about, if it's real, if it's true, if it's from God. First, true love is grounded in the gospel. True love comes from, originates from, finds its meaning in the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to what John said. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. That was the mark of truth. Do they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? Is that love grounded in the reality that Christ died for sinners and rose again from the dead? Because that is the only place that true love originates from. Anything else? It's a farce. It's a forgery. It's not true. It's not real. It must be grounded in the gospel. The second thing he said was, you will know true love for God in Jesus Christ when you see this. When you see people who obey my commands. If you are my friends, you will obey my commands. You will do what Jesus says. Oh, it doesn't mean that true Christians then are are perfect, that they're without sin. No, we we spoke some other words from 1 John quite often in church. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But it does mean we take sin seriously. Seriously. It does mean we listen, and when God says, this is wrong, we know that it's wrong. And when he says, this is right, we know that it's right. It does mean that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we want to walk in God's ways, that we do not excuse sin, that we do not come up with our own truths and our own definitions of what it means to love. And as wrong as our hearts are in the right place, it really doesn't matter what we do. No, those who know the love of Jesus Christ Obey his commands. And last but not least, true divine love that comes from God, if that true love dwells in you, you will love one another. You cannot say that you love God and not love your brother. Then you're just a liar. If you know the good news, the gospel, the love, God's love of Jesus Christ, then the reaction of that is to love one another as Christ Jesus has loved you. This past week, I I started to read a book. Um, Pastor Schley talked about it a couple weeks ago. I got me to take it off my bookshelf and start reading. It's called Encounters with Jesus by Tim Keller. I would imagine for the next month or so, it'll kind of be the foundation of my own devotional life. I I read the first chapter this week. It's really good. But I also enjoyed the introduction. Tim Keller explains why he wrote the book, because it's kind of how he found Jesus. When he was in college, he was invited to be a part of a small group Bible study, and they were going to study the Gospel of John, and the 13 encounters John had with individuals through the Gospel of John. They were going to dig into it. They were going to see how Jesus loved people, what he said to them, the questions he asked, the things he talked about, the ways people responded, and how Jesus treated all kinds of different people. And they were convinced as they looked at those and dug into those, they themselves would encounter Jesus Christ. And sure enough, That's how he found Jesus. That's how he found the love of Jesus Christ. And he began to then live in the love of Jesus Christ, to love his neighbors, to love your neighbor. That's God's call to us. Your neighbor, you know, not just the person that lived next door to you, God uses it in a much broader context than that. Your neighbor. Everyone who needs your help, your kindness, your assistance. Which is everyone? 
the best place I know how to learn how to love my neighbor is, is the Ten Commandments. I just, Jesus just spells it out. Uh, God's word just spells it out so clear. It, here, here's how you love your neighbors. It starts in the home. Learn to love like Jesus loves you first and foremost. Start with your closest neighbor, your spouse. Learn to love your spouse like Jesus loves you. And then, your kids, your family. You honor your parents. Your kids honor their parents. Parents honor and cherish their kids. And you learn to love one another as Christ has loved you in your home. That's the first and most important place. And then you come to the church. And you learn to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You learn to love and to speak the truth in love and to repent and to forgive and live under God's umbrella of grace and to walk in truth and righteousness with people who believe what you believe about Jesus Christ. And then you love the world. You love those who are different than you, who have a different religion, who have different cultures, different nationalities, different behaviors, different beliefs, different life. God calls you to have the same heart towards them that he does. Heart filled with compassion. Concern. Concern for their heart, for their eternal well-being. And to engage them in the same compassion and love that God has for them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, I know that for every person sitting in this room today, uh, your life of relationships have been from off the charts positive to off the charts painful. No matter where you are on that continuum or somewhere in between, uh, the answer for us is all the same. To find healing and hope and forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ, and as we experience love from him, to love one another. Oh, my prayer is that you continue to know the deep and profound love of Jesus Christ, that you learn from him and his ways, and that you live for him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Jesus, um, we, do, we do wrestle um, with the lusts of the flesh versus true love from you, and so we pray that you'd teach us the difference. Help us, to, help us to learn what your love is all about, that perfect, divine, selfless, sacrificial life seen in Jesus Christ on the cross and risen from the dead. For only when our hearts and our minds know the love of Jesus Christ, can we truly love one another the way you intend? Only then can people find life-giving love in us, through us, in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, teach us to love one another as you have loved us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.